game reserve in South Africa, part of the greater Kruger and home to some fierce and amazing wildlife. For tourists, there's a chance to see these creatures in their natural habitat. But for poachers, there's a chance for money and meat. That means just one thing. Lots of people say it's not a war, nobody declared war. But we literally have a sighting or a contact per day in the greater um, Kruger and the whole of Kruger and the greater Limpopo National Park. There are places where it's extremely dangerous. In the intensive protection zone, uh, the people are exposed to people shooting at them. When you hear of people that got wounded or shot there, it was because they made contact. The poacher shot at us. I, I, I'm not sure what the current figure is, but we've had them five times, four times, shooting at our aircraft, at our helicopters. We've been hit very hard between December and February. We were hit incredibly hard, but in areas where we don't have enough manpower to deploy, so the poachers are avoiding us. But on the, on the southern African landscape, the rhinos are taking it really hot. You know, it's, uh, it's not getting any better. It's actually getting a bit worse. Baluli is a private reserve and they're trying something different. Squad, one, two, one, two. Squad, the all-female Black Mambas are an anti-poaching unit that leads the fight in South Africa's northernmost province. One, one, two. Despite the danger, they don't carry weapons. Because you shone. These are the bobbies on the beat. They're unarmed, but they cover vast hectares and they're positioned all over the show, especially in hot spots and so on. They look smart, they speak well, they have manners, and, uh, and they've got, they're a little bit assertive, but not overly so, and what have you. So without them, my armed response team wouldn't actually know what to do. They wouldn't really have a role to play. And you know, it's about institutional memory as well. So my black mambas know their beat very well. They can say that piece of paper wasn't lying here on my last patrol this morning. So somebody's been here. The Mambas are very aware of the methods and motivations of the poachers. Yes, yeah, some poachers, they come into our reserve. Some, they put some snares. Some, they are rhino poaching. Rhino poaching, they don't put some snares. They, like, they come with a gun. They come and kill and go out. So meat poachers, they come and put up some snares so that they, Maybe impala, giraffe, anything can attack by that snake. Some of them, they say, we don't work because in South Africa, the unemployment is too high. Some of them, if you catch them why are you, and ask them, why are you coming into our reserve to push? They say, I'm not working, I want to eat, something like that. Sometimes you can feel shame for them. But while the motivation of the poachers is well understood, Motivation for the Mambas is now being provided by an NCO course. The rank structure is a fantastic thing. It's a punishment and reward system that the army is so good at. If you do this, you get rewarded. If you do that, you get punished. You know, so it's something for them to aspire to be, to become a sergeant. It's run by Brits, provided by Veterans for Wildlife. And British veterans have a couple of particular qualities that are sought after. I think the skill set that the, the British veterans have got is is needed tremendously here. And also because, you know, they've been deployed. Most of the time they've been deployed, so they've exercised their training. It's not just people that have trained and, and hung around. They've, they've been places, they've done work, so they can bring those skill sets here. They're also multicultural as well. So we have, you know, we've got a, a tribal situation here with a tribal hierarchy and a lot of different African customs and so on. So we find the trainers from the United Kingdom seem to have a much easier integration with the tribal people here. The most important sergeants of the uh, The British Black forces Mambas. have integrated but women into, the, uh, into all levels, in fact, for quite a lot longer than many of the other forces in the world. So, you know, that's an easy choice for us then. Uh, it, was, it was quite fortuitous for us that there were uh, women available from the forces, you know, veterans that were prepared to come out. My name's Amy Nash, I'm a captain in the Royal Military Police Reserve and I've been in the army for about 13 years. So there was a, a message sent to me from a friend um, who said that there was a project ongoing with Veterans for Wildlife. Um, I looked into it and what they were requesting was someone to conduct a, a leadership and command course um, for 12 members, black members. Um, and so I thought, you know what, I'll apply 
and that's, uh, that's how it all came about. Iraq veteran Sergeant Ali Donaldson is joining Amy. He brings a very different set of skills. I was previously in the Royal Army Medical Corps for 13 years. I've just retired, uh, starting a new career path um, as a practice manager. And I'm out here with Veterans for Wildlife. Veterans for Wildlife have been sending British veterans since 2016. But 60 kilometres into the bush and the first senior command course isn't without its challenges. The main focus was leadership, um, as you can probably imagine from the title. So a lot of these ladies, they've done their job kind of day in, day out for, for a number of years. But they haven't necessarily had um, a command focus and, and it's good to be introducing a chain of command in their structure. You know what you're talking about now. So ladies listening. All the consequences what we have to do if we see the poachers are there. And remember, we called those standard operating procedures. So what you're doing, everyone should know. So you as a leader, everyone in your team must know what happens if something happens. All right? Mm -hmm. Good. 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 OK. Right. After you no cry, go and mount onto the vehicle. Initially, they were a little bit um, reticent, as you can probably imagine. But actually, as time went on, um, they really kind of grew towards us. So it, it helped immensely. Um, it meant that they would absorb the material. And, and in the end, we, we created what I hope to be quite a bond. But no matter how close the bond, the final patrol of the leadership course has to have standards to reach for. So there's a nominated leader um, for the test patrol. And that was the main person we were looking at for, um, for the test day. And that, it helped with choosing the best recruit as well. So we wanted to see how they commanded the situation. We also did a bit of a Kazivak as well. Um, and, and seeing how they actually adopted some of the command techniques that we described, communication skills, all that, all that good stuff. And it was a fantastic learning opportunity as well. Say, for example, when we had an incident, um, we'd bring the ladies together. And, and discuss how best to deal with that situation um, and communicate as a commander on the ground. And when the members go out on patrol, Amy's leadership work runs into Ali's first aid training. Got a casualty now. What's the, fir the very, very first thing? So let control, us see. Control. control the situation. Exactly. You have five other members on patrol with you. Yes. So at the moment, everyone's just staring at the casualty. What could they be doing? Right, no yeah. cry. Belinda. Big hint to you now, and ladies listening for this as well. The commander, you are in charge of everyone here. The best person to look after the casualty is not the commander. Remember the word delegation. Remember when I said that? OK. Yeah. So you are controlling the situation. One way to control it is by getting someone else to tend after the, the injury. Yeah. Do you understand that? Yes. So Who's who will you medic? delegate? Who's the best medic? What I've heard from them in the past is that they don't really touch on it at all. Good. And they, they do Much better. get casualties, which can be uh, upsetting for them. And it's how to deal with that upset and how to deal with it on the ground and the exact thing to do, whether they have the equipment to deal with it or not. Can they improvise? Can they use other stuff? And I, th I think they really took to the medical training because they've never had anything like it before. Well, there's a wildlife danger. I mean, we've got the, the, the most venomous snakes in the world here uh, for them. That is a big, big danger. And they've got all the big wildlife, the big five that can come across. And they walk across these things on a daily basis. So one day it'll go wrong. And that's what they've got to be prepared for. And as well as that, they've got the, the poaching. I mean, uh, it's only getting worse here. So not long before they start targeting the anti-poaching units. As they move on, the British veterans have a practical plan for testing on what is still a real-time patrol. So can you just tell us what's happening and where you're going now? Yeah, absolutely. So as part of their final test phase, what the ladies are going to be doing is, um, is a sweep, um, a sweep patrol, effectively, of any snares that might be in the area. We're heading towards a water hole at the moment, which is a um, prime kind of activity for animals. So ultimately, poachers will remain in the area quite a lot also. So what we need is the leader, the commander of the group, is to take control of the, uh, the remainder of the black mambas and move them in that direction towards the, uh, the water hole. Hey. 
Veterans for Wildlife has provided people to Baluli Nature Reserve in South Africa. They're running a junior command course for the all-female Black Mamba Anti-Poaching Unit. Another part of the training comes from armed guard, Fricky. He uses an old den to talk the mambas through some of the problems they're facing. Um, the lady, this, this was a poacher's camp, but a day camp. They will spend the day here, if they come in early morning, to go out at night again. Because this is true, we don't fly really here, we don't patrol here. And if you walk about 50 meters here, you'll see the tree there. If you stand there, you can see almost all Olifant's airstrip. You can see any movement of rhino, anything moving down there, any lights, any ambushes going out, anything that's basically we're trying to stop them. Um, so they will come here to hide, because it's thick brush for the choppers as well. So if we have he also a explains the, the choppers, intelligence they needed. Um, we had a complaint from the neighbouring farms that there was animals caught on snares that they um, found. Wild dogs, hyenas, um, buffalo recently. So we were just keeping our site clean as well and just doing our sweeps um, according to where they estimate we might find some snares um, to see if we can't remove them uh, to keep the, the animals safe. In general, it's quite bad. Um, we're losing more animals to snares. Um, a snare doesn't have a root. It doesn't have a sign telling something to move one side. So it just takes anything. Specifically, it might be snare poachers. Um, so we must just check this area very thoroughly. The money in the ivory trade draws poachers from miles around. And better informed, the mambas soon find a new den. So Colette, can you just tell us what this is? What, what have you found? This is the poachers camp. So freaking you the the one that is down there, so we think this is the new one because he haven't seen it before and there is bottles inside this camp, so it's a new camp for the poachers. And we even saw the tracks of rhino down there and facing that side. A footprint could be evidence. The guilty party isn't quite so guilty. But as the patrol continues, it seems an actual rhino could be nearby. What have you found? A rhino track. And the Mamba's tech comes into action. For monitoring reasons, we take down the track. We have a system called Seymour, so that reports to our main office. And that will basically just tell us where we found the tracks. And then it will just tell us that there is rhino activity in the area so that we can focus our patrols, night patrols and stuff around the area to try and keep them safe. With activity spotted and reported, the test patrol is coming to an end. And even those doing the training and testing are impressed by what they see of the mambas. They've done so far um, in this little area, I guess, I say little, in comparison to the rest of the national parks, it's, it's fantastic. They've got like a, a brilliant concept here, the black mambas. The course was all about promoting 12 of the black mambas, if possible, to a certain level. And with the course completed, the veterans and the mambas have reached their aim. And it's time for a passing out parade. Ladies, you should be extremely proud of yourselves. I am extremely proud of you. Sergeant Ali is extremely proud of you. Oh, that was fantastic, the pass out. So the whole purpose was to, to give them a, a real big celebration, I guess, to actually show them that what they've done is very, very worthwhile. Um, they'll get a pay increase, um, they get the sergeant stripes. So actually, it means that the rest of the black mambas have something to, to aspire to as well. Best recruit! So, uh, Sergeant Shadu! See? Oh. I was working hard, eh? I tried my level best in everything that I was doing. I studied hard, even the drill. Yeah, I did my best. Extremely excited. I didn't even think that I would be the best. Yeah, but I'm happy. Yeah.
There's time for both the trainers and the trained to reflect. My hat goes off to those ladies. They've got a, they've got a tough old job. And not only that, when they go back home as well, it, work is never ending for them, it would seem. What the, the surgeon and captain taught us, especially the leadership part, whereby I should, what I will teach my, my colleagues when we're at the bush, the first aid, that's the most important part, yeah, that I'll be teaching them when we're at the bush. It's not a military, they're not soldiers. Um, they're going out into the bush um, and often they're faced with possibly poachers, wildlife, you know, they're, they're daily patrols for quite a lot of kilometres as well. It's hard going. That surgeon and the captain, they were so good. They, even if you don't understand anything, they make it that you, until you, you understand it. Hopefully this will just go from strength to strength, build on what we've already established. And this is the first course that they've ever done, so hopefully that they can build on it and get better. They were good, they were kind, yeah. And then even when they were teaching, they made us understand every lesson, because when we do theory part, they immediately took us to do the practical part. So yeah, they were best. You could see them growing as individuals, even in the space of a, a two-week program. They came out the other end, you know, kind of bouncing, full of life and actually full of enthusiasm. So it's really positive to see. I feel so proud because I'm, I'm a woman saving those, those animals. And at the beginning they said this is a man's job, but I proved them wrong that even a woman can do this job. Not all passing out parades need a military band. British Armed Forces have a global reputation, set above the rest thanks to their skills and know-how. But the Black Mambas make a big impression of their own. Well, I had a huge lack of awareness about what's going on um, down here in South Africa. And so for me, the biggest learning point is actually there's, it's a daily struggle. It's never ending. You're, you're working 24 seven, you know. Um, and actually, there's so many things that everyone can do to combat what's going on here. But it's, it's got to be a coordinated effort. It, I think it will be a long struggle. It will be a long struggle.